Good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the seventh meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018. Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. And I start off with giving apologies from Mary Fee, who, because of the weather, is struggling to get through to the meeting today. Uh, agenda item one is the Continuing Care Scotland Amendment Order 2018, S5M 10206, which is draft subordinate legislation that is subject to the affirmative procedure. Information about the instrument is provided in paper one. I should explain that an affirmative instrument has two agenda items. Firstly, the committee will have the opportunity to ask questions of the minister and her officials. And after that, we will turn to agenda item two, when there will be a debate on the motion that is in the published agenda. And can I welcome to the meeting Marie Todd, MSP, Minister for Child Care and Early Years, Dr Caroline Uni, Corporate Parenting and Formal Care Team Leader, and Arezo Darvish Zarda, Children and Family Solicitor, Scottish Government, and I invite the Minister to make an opening statement to explain the order. Thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to introduce this draft instrument before the committee today. The Continuing Care Amendment Order amends Article 2 of the Continuing Care Scotland Order 2015 with the effect that from 1st April 2018, the higher age limit for eligible persons specified for the purposes of Section 26A 2B of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 is increased from 19 to 20 years of age. That means from 1st April, an eligible person for the purposes of the duty on local authorities to provide continuing care under Section 26A of the 1995 Act is a person who is at least 16 years of age and who has not yet reached the age of 20. By virtue of Article 3 of the 2015 order, the local authority's duty to provide continuing care lasts from the date on which an eligible person ceases to be looked after until the date of their 21st birthday. In summary, continuing care and the accompanying secondary legislation stresses the importance of encouraging and enabling young people to remain in their care setting until they are able to demonstrate their readiness and willingness to move on to interdependent living. Interdependence more accurately reflects the day-to-day -day realities of an extended range of health interpersonal relationships, social support and networks. Continuing care undoubtedly normalises the experience of care-experienced young people in kinship, foster and residential care by allowing strong and positive relationships between young person and carer to be maintained and reducing the risk of multiple simultaneous disruptions occurring in their lives as they approach adulthood. This draft order is essentially a procedural amendment to increase the higher age limit for eligible persons from 19 to 20 years of age as part of an agreed annual rollout strategy, increasing the higher age range in step with the first eligible cohort of 16 year olds until eventually, by next April 2019, the entitlement will cover all young people who cease to be looked after on or after their 16th birthday to remain in continuing care between up to their 21st birthday. This draft order will revoke the Continuing Care Scotland Order 2017 and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Do any members have uh, questions of clarification? Joanne? Well, I'm not sure if it's clarification. I think we would all support the policy and commend the young people, care experienced young people who drove this agenda and made sure that, that there, there were changes in the legislation. I recall it feel like a year ago when we were debating the order that preceded this one, which presumably would be taken up to 18. But I am interested in what work you've done on your awareness of how much this is actually being implemented, because we can roll out the procedure, but if we're not rolling out the reality for our young people, we're failing them. So I wonder if you've got figures on the numbers of young people who have benefited from this, from 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, and presumably 19-year-olds thus far, and what work has been done to ensure that young people are aware and in, those who are caring for them are aware of these changes? So the demographic information and the data on numbers and types of placements collected and children looked after in Scotland are reported in the annual national statistics um, 
publication in children's social work statistics. The first full year of data on continuing care will be collected in 2017, and depending on the data quality, it will be published from March this year. Um, the Scottish Government works with local authorities continually to review data collection and to agree any changes to further collections um, and developments, for example, proposals to collect new data or to stop collecting data. Due to the time required for local authorities to procure changes to their own systems, any changes made to collections are put in place for two years ahead, with key sto stakeholders including Celsius, Scottish Through Care and Aftercare Forum staff and the Fostering Network to gather information that will give us an indication of take-up rates and identify any particular barriers to eligible young people being provided with this entitlement. Yeah. So, to be clear, thus far we don't know. No. We have no idea... Although we're extending it, we have no idea whether actually young people know or not. I wonder what conversations you've had with local authorities and those working particularly with uh, young people with care experience to establish. I certainly have heard anecdotally that, it, that um, it doesn't appear to be something that has moved on in any great in any great way. And I wonder if you would agree that there should be some. We can do the procedural stuff here. That's easy, and I commend you for doing that. But if the reality out there is that young people are neither aware nor benefiting from, I think we're failing the high expectations people had of the legislation, and I wonder what suggestions you might have. I mean, data gathering is one thing, mm -hmm. but actually engaging in a, put, a debate with or a conversation with local authorities, COSLA, um, care experience young people themselves, what needs to be done, I think, would be probably... I don't want to come back here in another year, move it on one more year, and we have no, still no evidence that things have changed. No, I would agree. And I think that, in fact, there will be probably some progress to report by the time I come and see you next month in front of this committee. I'm coming to appear in front of this committee on the 21st of March, and I would hope to have um, some more um, detail to report to you then when I come and see you then. I also have um, a number of issues on the policy implementation have been raised with me by Kezia Dugdale, who is a substitute member on this committee. I plan to meet with her at the end of March, um, and I would expect um, to be able to hear her concerns and um, for us to act on those concerns at that time. So our meeting next month, you'll be able to identify, you'll be able to report back on the discussions you've had with local authorities about progress thus far? I hope to be able to give you a report of some of the progress that's going on in policy implementation next month. Thank you. I'll be able, definitely be able to give you some more detail. Sorry, Ms. That theme, Minister, and very briefly, uh, could you just explain what conversations you've had with local authorities about how to publicise this? Because I think you know the the information sharing on this is very important, and just to make people aware of what they can have in terms of assistance. So. We supported the developing of a continuing care focus group of local authority representatives inviting feedback on issues arising from the implementation of continuing care in their own local authorities and that forum has been gathering information on the use of continuing care and offers peer support to develop and resolve any issues so there is undoubtedly work going on. The Scottish Through Care and Aftercare Forum also supported by the Scottish Government hold regular management and practitioner events that share information on continuing care. And we fund the Centre of Excellence for Looked After Children, Celsius, who are producing regular practitioner documents on all aspects of the 2014 Act and hold conferences and events that include workshops on continuing care. And I've also written an article for the Fostering Network, um, Scotland Magazine, inviting the foster care readership to ask any questions or give feedback on continuing care since its implementation in 2015. Okay, thank you, uh, Minister. I think that's very helpful. It's just, uh, you know, I think some people are unaware um, of, of what they can actually have in terms of assistance. So it would be helpful if we can uh, find ways to publicise this. Absolutely, I agree. George, you wanted to come in? Sir, it's just on the fact that, uh, on back of what Joanne and Liz have already said, is the fact that during the process, I was on the committee during that time, and one of the most exciting parts where it was a group of young people that effectively changed legislation, and it was probably one of the best uh, parts of the last term when I was here, was just seeing their faces, the fact that this was life-changing. And the important part is to make sure that we do uh, make it work. Mm -hmm. But 
one of the strong points was that came from the third sector and the, a lot of the kind of agencies involved with the young people. Have you had much interaction with them to make sure that you know we can still keep the dialogue going and whether they can actually tell us how? Because their testimony the last time was what made all the difference, and I think it's important that we know that you know what's coming from them with the way, and they're probably key to making this work as well. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. You'll be well aware of the care review, the root and branch review of the whole care system that's going on, and there is a huge level of engagement. Although that's independent of government, there's a huge level of engagement between the third sector, the um, uh, individuals who are care experienced, and that review process. Um, and I gather you have Fiona Duncan form the care review coming to give evidence to the committee, so I think you'll get a great deal of reassurance from that about how involved they are in developing both policy and legislation going forward. Thank okay. Thank you. Uh, any other members wish to comment? In that case, can I um, move to agenda item two, which is a formal debate on motion S5M 10 206 in the name of the Minister and I remind everyone that officials are not permitted to contribute to formal debates of this kind and I ask the Minister to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. Uh, I invite contributions from any members who have them. In that case, I will now put the question to the committee. The question is that motion S5M 10206 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The committee must report to Parliament on this instrument. Are members content for me as convener to sign off a report? Thank you. And that concludes our consideration of agenda item two. Uh, thank you, Minister and officials, for um, your attendance. And I suspend the meeting to allow witnesses to leave and for the crowd behind you to disperse. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, item three on the agenda is the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007, Prescribed Services, Protected Adults, Amendment Regulations 2018, SSI 2018-28. Information on the instrument is provided in Paper 2. This is a negative instrument and will come into force unless Parliament agrees to a motion to annul it. No motion to annul has been lodged. Members will see that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the instrument on 20th February 2018 and determined that there were no issues within its remit to draw to the attention of the Parliament. Do members have any comments on the instrument? Okay, in that case, uh, I move on to the next uh, agenda item, which is a consideration of Paper 3, which is an update from the Committee's EU reporter, Gillian Martin, MSP. Gillian, I understand you'd like to say a few words. Yes, thank you, Convenus. So you've all got my uh, EU reporter's report in front of you. I want to start by putting on record of thanks to North East Scotland College for uh, everything they did for us in Peterhead uh, the other week when we were up um, visiting there. I know how much effort goes into organising uh, um, visits like that, and we, found, we all found it very worthwhile. And it's no surprise to committee members that one of the main themes of the visit at Nescol in Peterhead was uncertainty over Brexit. Um, funding for fishermen training at the Scottish Maritime Academy largely comes from the EU, and there's no clarity as to how that funding will be replaced or the extent of the impact of the removal of that funding. And in addition, the EU 27 students that m myself and Ross Greer uh, met um, reflected they had no idea what the, the future held, saying that they had little or no contact from the UK government or their embassies. Um, and the only information that they had received about Brexit was from the Scottish Government in relation to tuition fees. And we turn into the figures on the EU 27 students um, applying to study in Scotland in Paper 3. I'm pleased to see that there's not been a notable dip in numbers. And uh, I imagine that the funding of tuition fees from the Scottish Government may well have influenced that. And lastly, there's some information on um, Erasmus. Um, and I'd like to ask the clerks if they will ensure that members receive the report to be published by the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in March uh, for this committee's ongoing interest. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, 
There is a suggestion on page one of the paper for the, for the convener to write back to the Finance and Constitution Committee, noting the lack of overlap in the areas highlighted and indicating that we currently have no plans to undertake work in these areas. The committee will, however, continue to monitor wider EU issues, such as the scope for participation in Erasmus uh, Plus after Brexit, the number of EU27 students applying to Scottish HEIs, etc. Uh, and you, the clerks will do the work that you asked them to do. Uh, does the committee have any comments on these recommendations? Joanne? I gentlemen, to agree with, with those recommendations and, and to thank Julian for the paper. I think it was really interesting. I wondered, I mean, I don't know how many people in here, but certainly I didn't want to leave um, the European Union. And I um, you know, recognise that, for example, the issue around uh, the funding of European students was, was necessary. That, and I can remember Mike Russell at the time saying, you know, this was something he had to do in terms of his obligations. Have we got any sense of what, maybe you can't speak for the government in this proposal, but do you have a sense in the conversations you've had, whether we're now in a position where we're saying that we are presuming in Scotland that we would fund EU students as long as we're in the European Union? And, or is it that we still we have to do it, we don't have any choice? So do we have any sense of what would happen if we do end up leaving? I think that's a question for the government rather than the media. Even though, I mean, I'm just interested whether this is a conversation yeah. that's been picked mm -hmm. up anywhere. But I'm, I'm certainly, the, the impression that I'm sure we also agree, the impression that we got from the, the students that we met was that the extension was very welcome. And so a couple of them actually said that we asked them, uh, have you got family members that had been planning to move over here that have decided as a result not to. And there was mixed results. Some said that actually there was maybe sort of they weren't moving it along, but they were waiting to see what happened. And I think the fact that we're given, we're given a, a sense that we still want to welcome them to study over here will mean that they actually will make the decision to still come over here. And I, th I think that was, that's, I got the impression it was very welcome from the people that we spoke to. Um, so I think we're doing all the right things. Okay. I don't think it seems to be an obligation. I think it's actually a desire rather than an obligation. That's the impression I get. Thanks very much, Shelley. Uh, no other comments in that case. Is the committee content for the European reporter to pursue the action points on behalf of the committee? In that case, I formally close the meeting. Was that to your liking?